turn once again in your Bibles to the book of 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, you can find in the church Bibles on page 282. You turn there. We're continuing on in our sermon series on 1 Samuel. Last week we saw this young man, not even named until the latter half of the chapter 16, anointed as the next king over Israel. Though those who were present at that anointing might not have understood all that was going on. Now we come to chapter 17, which I believe takes place somewhere in between verses 21 and 23 of chapter 16. This is an an event that happens somewhere along the line in David's service to Saul as his musician. This is an interesting story. It's an exciting story. We'll read the first 30 verses of this story. But it's a true story, and more than that, it's God's story. So give now attention to the reading of God's holy word for you. 1 Samuel chapter 17, going to verse 30. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah in Ephesdamim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped at the valley of Elah, and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out From the camp of the Philistines, a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits in a span. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shema. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand, morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, Take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers. And take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well, and bring some token from them. Now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper, and took the provisions and went, as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion 
The Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him and great riches with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. So far, the reading of God's word. Would you pray once again with me, please? O God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David, open our eyes this morning, we pray, that we may behold wonderful things out of your prophecy, your true history, of your anointed one, who saves his people. We pray this in his name. Amen. I'd like to follow that story with another story this morning. This is a, a story more recent in history. This took place in 2020 and around the beginning of 2021. And you're saying, well, I want to forget 2020 ever happened. Okay, well, let's just roll back the clock a little bit and remember an incident that at least I found very interesting that happened at the end of 2020 and really came in full at the beginning of the new year. Uh, it's the story of a, of a man who went by different names, including the name Roaring Kitty. That's Kitty Cat Meow. He went by the name Roaring Kitty, and this man had a YouTube channel, and in 2020, he was telling folks on his YouTube channel that he thought that GameStop was a good buy on the stock market. Now, GameStop, if you're not familiar, is a video game retail store, one that has been floundering for years. And this man, Roaring Kitty, gave his two cents, and he said, I'm going to buy up these stocks. I think they're valuable. I think they're, they're worth something. And the idea caught on. If you know the story, perhaps you were a part of the story. Hopefully you were. If you were, I want to come and make friends with you. Because if you know the story, you know what happened. The idea catches on, and before you know it, GameStop's stocks, their shares, have gone from around $18 a share to around $500 a share. Many rich and powerful people lost a lot of money in the process. Many people were panicking, in part thanks to the aptly named brokerage app Robinhood, which made it easy for your average Reddit user to jump online and jump on the bandwagon and buy up GameStop's stock. There's a recent movie, I'm not recommending it, I think there's a ton of swearing and, and foul stuff in it, but there is a new movie come, that's just come out that describes this event, and, it, and the, the tagline or the, the, the plot synopsis goes like this. This is the ultimate David versus Goliath tale. The ultimate one. An insane true story of everyday people who flipped the script on Wall Street and got rich by turning GameStop, yes, the mall video game store, into the world's hottest company. Now, I don't know if the creators of this movie have read the Bible, but if, you don't need to have read the Bible to know what a David and Goliath story is. It's one of the perhaps few and, and, now, and, and quickly diminishing stories of the Bible that still has purchase in the social consciousness here in this country. You, you talk about a David and Goliath ta tale, and immediately any number of you, you're in church, but any number of folks outside of the church will be able to tell you an example you can think of examples from sports, from politics, maybe examples from your own life. There's different, different ways of thinking of these David and Goliath stories. As I've heard a, a football player put it once, there's the story of the underdog who's a hungry dog, and the hungry dog runs faster. These are, these are stories that grip us. 
right? Because it's a story about the little guy who finds the courage and the tenacity or perhaps just plain luck to beat the big guy. At least that's what many people think a David and Goliath story is. Little guy finds courage, tenacity, even pugnacity, pugnaciousness to fight off and defeat the big bad. If that's the definition of a David and Goliath story, then is 1 Samuel 17 a David and Goliath story? I would actually tell you this morning it's not. The story of 1 Samuel chapter 17 is not a story ultimately of how giant Goliath was beat back by courageous, tenacious, pugnacious David. This is not ultimately a story of David and Goliath even. It's a story of God and Goliath. This is a story about how God sought to deal with the Goliath problem and how God, who is much bigger and much faster, much wiser and much stronger than his enemy, defeated him. I think we'll see this more clearly as we look at the first half of this chapter this morning. And Lord willing, we'll return to the chapter next week as we, as we come together and celebrate the Lord's table. We'll get to con- see the conclusion of this story. You know how it ends, and yet as we meditate on this, I hope we'll understand and see that this is really a story of what God has done for his people and how God has delivered them from their enemies. Now as we look at this first half of the chapter, I think the most helpful way to go about it is to see it as a series of contrasts. You know, a contrast, right? You know, vanilla and chocolate, black and white, you know, up and down. We, we see a couple of these contrasts, more than a couple, In fact, I would suggest at least five contrasts in the chapter, actually probably more, but there will be at least five that we'll focus on as the the structure of of our time and our study this morning. And I think that the Bible does this intentionally to give us a highlight for the differences between the two. When you're contrasting something, you're showing the difference between them. And so we'll look at these contrasts together in our minutes that follow. So to begin, the first contrast we find in the passage is the contrast between Israel and Philistia, the Israelites and the Philistines. And so as you look at the Israelites, what do we find? Well, we know, and especially if you're familiar with the Old Testament and hopefully at least familiar somewhat with the book of 1 Samuel, we know that the Israelites are those who are the covenant people of God. They are the, 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 the church under age, as some theologians have talked about. They are God's people gathered, called out of darkness, and in covenant relationship, in a, in a promise relationship with God. God has promised to be God to them, to defend them, to protect them, deliver them from all their enemies. This is Israel's identity. And yet... This people group is set up alongside the Philistines. And you'd think the people, covenant people of God would look pretty good against God's enemies. And, and yet in the contrast, we find that God's enemies are gaining ground. Now, if your geography of the ancient Near East is a little rusty, that's okay. Um, mine is as well. You, sometimes your Bibles have maps in the back. I encourage you to make use of them if you do. But even if you don't, just note this. Notice where the battle is taking place. They were gathered at Soko, the text says, which belongs to Judah. In other words, they are fighting on Israelite territory. Now, if you remember where we've been in 1 Samuel, you'll know that under Samuel's judgeship, the enemies, and particularly the Philistines, were defeated, beat back again and again and again. And then under Saul... Saul himself, the first king of Israel, saw numerous successes, not necessarily to the Philistines who would be over in the west, but but to the Amalekites and to others in the east. And so, what are the Philistines doing in Judah? In fact, as we look at this passage, we don't have time to look at all of these things, but but it's interesting to note that there are some parallels, as one commentator has pointed out. Um, There are numerous parallels with this passage and the passages we find in the book of Joshua. Except what we find is the reverse. In the book of Joshua, we find God's covenant people led by God, defeating God's enemies. What do we find in this passage? We find God's enemies defeating God's people and taking back the promised land. They are less than 20 miles from Bethlehem. Less than 20 miles from David's town. The Philistines are encroaching. They're moving in. They are gathered along this 
uh, this encampment here, they are in Ephes Demim, which means blood boundary. And much blood has been spilled there. The blood of God's holy ones. The blood of God's covenant people. That's a contrast that we're meant to see here this morning. That God's enemies look mighty and fierce and they are beating the people of God. So what's going on here? What's really going on here? How could this be that God's covenant people are losing? Well, we begin to understand it more as we see the contrast, the second contrast, excuse me, between Goliath and Saul's army. It really is Goliath versus Saul's army here. As we look at Goliath, we see that he is, as may be expected, great and terrible. Anytime you want to talk about something that's really big or really bad, you call it a Goliath. You know, there's a, there, are, there are weapons called Goliaths. There are vehicles called Goliaths. There are beetles called Goliaths. I never want to meet one because they're big and they're nasty. This man is big and he's nasty. And he's big and nasty first in his appearance. The height that we are given uh, translates to nine feet, nine inches. If you're having trouble understanding that, I actually, we, we, we put up a little sign outside my office. So, after the service, not during, but after the service, you can go out and check it to see what nine foot nine actually looks like. He's tall. Now, there are some ancient translations of this passage, particularly the Greek Septuagint, that try to minimize his height. They actually say, well, he was really more like six foot nine. Which given, uh, as far as I can tell, the average height in the ancient world is about five foot five. That's still pretty tall. But I think nine nine is actually accurate and correct. I don't get all the reasons for that, but I think what happened in, in subsequent translations is some could not believe that a man would be this tall. Nine nine. Now we actually have on the uh, in, on record in the modern age that some folks who have gotten close to nine nine, which is maybe startling to you. Um, you see some basketball players and you wonder they're not quite nine nine, but they're pretty up there. But yet we understand here that that giants are not only not. Uh, necessarily uh, impossible, but we are in fact called to expect this in the Old Testament. As we look at the history of Israel, we see that giants actually played a very important part in their, their founding and in their history. And in fact, as they came into the promised land, the Hebrews called these groups of people, they didn't use the word giant, they used words like Nephilim, or more commonly, Anakim. These were immense and, I believe, demonically empowered people. People who were indeed large in stature, large in talk and bravado, and large in their abilities to demolish their enemies. And they dwelt in the land of Canaan, the promised land, where the Israelites were called to go by God after they were taken out of Egypt. These giants were one of the main reasons, if you remember the story from Numbers 13 and 14, these were one of the main reasons why the Israelites rebelled against God and refused to enter the promised land because the people in there are giant and we are like grasshoppers before them. That was the excuse of 10 of the 12 spies that went to spy out the land of Canaan. We can't possibly compete. But yet when God brought Joshua to lead the people finally into the promised land, what happens? God delivers the Anakim into their hands. And they are driven back to Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod in Joshua chapter 11. All, you'll note, cities of Philistia. Remember, the Ark of the Covenant passed from Gaza to Gath to Ashdod. The giants that lived there had seen this. They felt the curse that God had placed upon them back in the earlier portions of 1 Samuel chapter 4 and 5. But yet, Israel seems to have a short memory. Remember that whole story in Chapter 5 and 6 of 1 Samuel 4, 5 and 6 is showing us how strong God is over the enemies of God and the false gods of the Philistines, and yet Israel forgets this. And so now, as one of the Anakim, one of the Gathites, stands before them, they are shaking like little grasshoppers, quivering before a mighty giant. But lest we judge them too harshly, it's not just his stature that is so great and terrible. Notice that we are given... Uh, uh, no, a number of very intricate details about his armament. This is actually very uncommon in the Bible. When the Bible slows down to describe someone's appearance, we should take note because it doesn't happen all that often. And so we get this man's appearance, not only his height, his immense stature, and his location from Gath, but we also find out that he is covered in this coat of mail. M-A-I-L. 
um, this coat of mail, this, this armor he has, this bronze armor, and yet, uh, while I think that's an accurate translation, uh, it's not exactly, literally, what the, the Hebrew says. The Hebrew poetically somewhat says he's covered in scales. Like a fish, yes, also, as the Bible talks, like a dragon or a serpent. We've seen serpents before. Nahash, his name meant serpent. He was the enemy of God. This serpent, slithery, scaly creature now comes before the people of God. And he's covered in scales. That is setting him up to be identified as one of God's enemies, one of God's people's enemies. And not only is this just a coat of scaly armor, it's weighing what, just notice because again, we don't always have the figures in front of us. This is 125 pounds, just his mail. Not everything else that he's wearing right now. Just this vest he has on is 125 pounds. This man is immense. Plug for next week. You wonder how they knew how much it weighed. Now, we were also told that he is wielding a spear that is like a weaver's beam. Again, something we might not be so commonly acquainted with, but you can imagine a very, very thick spear. Uh, Richard Phillips, in his commentary, says, imagine the, 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 the uh, axle or the drop shaft of an F-150, and that's the thickness you have of his spear. And to top it all off, quite literally, the head of this spear is weighing 16 pounds of iron. Now, this is around 1000 B.C. We are just entering into what is called the Iron Age. So not only is this man giant, not only is he clothed in heavy armor, but he is at the technological pinnacle and that's not surprising. Philistia, being a, a sea people, a trading uh, nation, quite possibly would have access to such technologies. So just to recap, we've got a big bad who is not only stronger, taller, faster than the Israelites, but he's more well-equipped. What do we have in contrast to this great and terrible man? We find the Israelites weak, ill-equipped, ill-prepared, but one other contrast we do need to see between them before moving on is the fact that it's not just what Goliath is looking like that is intimidating the, the Israelites here, you notice. It's also what he's saying to them. God's enemies speak. And I don't know if we always remember that. There's a constant catechesis, a constant teaching, a constant, uh, a constant uh, sermon coming from the enemies of God, speaking into the ears of God's people. And we see that here with how Goliath addresses the people. Not only does he walk a big walk, he talks a big talk. And he is caught defying the armies of Israel. He even says it as much. He says, I defy you. But there's an important principle here too we need to understand. And is this, you cannot defy God's people without also defying God himself. You cannot defy God's people without also defying God himself. So what he was really doing was defying the Lord God. What he was really doing, in other words, was blaspheming God. Now, God's people are not perfect, and sometimes the world rightfully does shame us not living up to our doctrine. We should take those rebukes and learn from them. That's God's grace to us even through pagans and unbelieving people. But this is a different situation. Goliath is not defying them because of their own sinfulness. He's actually defying them because he thinks their God is too weak. Looks like Goliath of Gath also has short memory, not remembering what happened when the Ark of the Covenant went to Gath. And yet in case, any case, he decides to blaspheme the Almighty One of Israel, the Holy One of Israel, the Lord God of hosts. You remember as Elkanah worshipped him, and he blasphemes him. Now, blasphemy, I understand, is not a word we typically throw around these days. I'm not even sure most people really know what it means. I like this definition that I found from an old Jesuit Catholic philosopher, Francisco Suarez. He says, he's writing in about the 17th century, blasphemy is any word of malediction, reproach, or contumely, if I'm even pronouncing that right, Pronounced against God. Okay, so you define a hard word with an even harder word. What does that mean, consumingly? It means that he has harsh disdain for God. 
He has contempt for God. In fact, he has slanderous speech against God. That's what blasphemy is. Goliath is blaspheming God. 40 days and 40 nights. Blaspheming God in the ears of all the people and not a one of them will stand up to stop it. Goliath, the great and terrible, gives us a grim portrait of the satanic power at work. And I do mean satanic, because after all, the word Satan in the Bible just means slanderer. He slanders God's people, and he slanders God. He seeks to slander the very name and defy the very name of God, and he, that is Satan, is powerful. Even today, 1 Peter 5 reminds us, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Or Ephesians chapter 6, again, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. We do not wrestle against politicians and governments and people. We wrestle against rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenlies. Paul tells us, God tells us, we face a spiritual enemy. and He is powerful. An ancient foe, as Martin Luther describes him, in a mighty fortress is our God. His wrath and power are great. And armed with cruel hate on earth is not his equal. So in the face of this ancient, fearsome foe, we find the people of Saul's army, the men of Saul's army are quaking and shaking. And ultimately, they're not willing to stand. And why would they? They're faithless. They're absent. They're absent-minded. They don't have the things of God in mind. Instead, all they see before them is the great enemy that they face. And of course, Saul tries to sweeten the pot by promising riches, by promising freedom. Remember, Saul had claim to all the families of Israel. He says, I'll relinquish my claim on your family. I'll even give you my family. I'll even give you my daughter. Why would they take that bait? Because what good is freedom and fame and the king's daughter if you're a dead man? That's the contrast we're meant to see. Fearsome Goliath against the fragile, faithless army of Saul. This leads to a third contrast that we find, and this is a contrast perhaps that's very prominent, maybe the most prominent, uh, some think, I, I disagree, but some think in this text, and that is the contrast between Saul and David. Saul and David. It's uh, interesting to note that Saul was included as those who were quaking and shaking. Now, you would hope that the king of Israel would at least be willing to answer the charge of this champion, Goliath. Remember, Goliath is looking for a champion of Israel. He's looking for a strong man of Israel. You, we look at, at, at Greek stories and Greek myths. We think about the, the Achilles. We think about uh, in the Aeneid, Aeneas. We think about Odysseus, these great men, these kings who rose up when their men were too weak and they, they saved, well, Odysseus doesn't actually save his men. He loses all his men, but he at least saves his family. That's nice. But they saved themselves and they saved their people. And yet we find Saul, perhaps a little bit older, but not necessarily less in strength, and he's scared. He's not willing. This is the man, remember, who was leading the charge. This is the man who tore oxen apart and sent them to the 12 tribes and said, so be it done to the man who does not follow me into the battle. And yet now we find a much different portrait of Saul. You'd hope at least that he would be willing to try. And yet we know why he's not willing to try. Because we've read chapter 16 and we know that he has a different spirit now. The Holy Spirit who had empowered him, who had strengthened him in his fight, God's grace that had been to him is now taken away. And instead all that Saul has is constant paranoia, anxiety, fear. In fact, the only state that we are, have a right to have apart from the gracious work of God in our hearts so Saul is scared. He has strong flesh, perhaps, but an unwilling spirit. An unwilling spirit. Contrasted with this, we find David. David, who is introduced to us once again in detail. You almost wonder if 
the author of 1 Samuel forgot that he's already introduced David to us. He gives us his background again, his brothers. He lays it all out very meticulously and in and, and de- and detail. But I think that there's actually a purpose in this. Again, just like with Goliath, we're meant to see and to, to meditate on the, the immensity of this foe of God. In the same way, we're supposed to follow the details of this humble servant, this youngest, littlest son of Jesse, who himself is an aged man. He's not the firstborn, he's not the secondborn, he's the eighthborn of Jesse's sons. And yet what sets him apart, it is the fact that he has been anointed by the Lord. He has been filled with the Holy Spirit. He has been appointed by God to save God's people. And yet, as I mentioned at the beginning, before we did our reading, uh, it seems that his family was not entirely aware of this fact. Now, they saw the anointing. Perhaps they were a little jealous of it. But to them, the anointing was just a distinction of honor. So here's Samuel anointing David because he thinks David must be really nice. Perhaps that even goaded them a little bit. I don't know for sure. But perhaps that stirred up jealousy like, like Joseph's brothers were jealous against him for his coat of many colors. Whatever the case They certainly don't seem to treat him very well when he does arrive, and he brings a charcuterie board. I mean, how could you be mad about that? But they're mad at him. Eliab particularly is mad at him because he doesn't understand that this young man, however height he is, maybe five foot five, maybe smaller, maybe a little bit taller, certainly not as tall as Saul, as we'll see in the next portion of chapter 17, certainly not as big and bad as Saul was, And yet this humble young man is the Lord's anointed, raised up by God in the face of the abject failure of Saul. We find him one who is faithful and faith-filled to deliver God's people from all of their adversities. And this actually should take us to a fourth contrast. And this, I do think, is very, very much at the center of the story here. And again, this is where we go astray when we start thinking this is a story just about David. This is a story contrasting Goliath and the Lord God. David calls attention to this. You notice he's the first, the first words we actually get from David at all in the Bible are words that remind us that God is at work here. You look that there again, down, um, down if you turn it, well, I turned my page over, but you look down there at verse 26, and he says, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, we're getting a little personal, aren't we, David? And what's, what's this circumcision have to do with it? Is this an ad hominem attack? Is he just kind of throwing it back at Goliath? Well, not exactly. What is David saying here? David is shining a light on Goliath's identity. Now, the Israelites look at Goliath, and all they see is big, bad, scary guy. But David looks at Goliath, and what does he see? He sees a Philistine outside of the covenant promises of God. That's what circumcision is. It's a sign of the covenant. It's a sign of the promise. It's a sign of the relationship that God has with his people. The almighty living God, David says. Physically, Goliath has not been marked for God through circumcision. And that reminds David, although all the other Israelites forgot, it reminds David that spiritually speaking, this dangerous giant is actually a dead man. He's a dead man. He's dead to God. That's Goliath's identity. No matter his physical strength or his impressive technology, nothing would change this. Goliath is as good as dead. Now, some of you, um, I don't, uh, if there are children here, I would speak to the children, but I'll just speak to the child and you all. <laughs> you remember what it's like to be afraid of the dark. Maybe some of you are actually afraid of the dark. Still, I won't blame you. There's a reason why people are afraid of the dark. Our imaginations tend to run wild in all the wrong directions. And and so there in the dark, you're trying to sleep. Suddenly, you you see something sitting at the chair at the foot of your bed. And immediately, your mind tells you, that's definitely a monster. That's definitely a ghost. That's definitely a creepy clown doll that's going to strangle me underneath my bed. And maybe that's where my imagination goes. Maybe I'm just talking about myself here. But, But then mom and dad turn the light on, right? 
Isn't that how it wants to work? Mom and dad turn the light on, and you see that it was just that silly coat. It was just that blanket that she left laying out. That's what David's doing here. He's turning the light on for them. He's like, don't you see the situation for what it really is? Yeah, Goliath's fierce. Yeah, Goliath is scary. But God's scarier. God's bigger. He's saying to the Israelites, don't you see who this is? This Goliath, he's just an unbelieving, uncircumcised mark for wrath and destruction pagan. And who does he think he is? That he's going to talk back to the Almighty God and blaspheme him. God is not impressed. God is never impressed with any of the slander that God's enemies will sling at his people and at him. God is unchanging. God is unfazed. God is almighty and God is living and active in this world. God is not some deistic God that sits up there kind of letting things go along their course. No, he is the sovereign one, holy and true, Bible says. Yet in the end, why did David have any confidence that God would deliver him from Goliath? Specifically, him. It's enough you say that God is big, God is strong. Okay, God is bigger than Goliath. That's fair, we can affirm that. But why was David so confident that God could save them from the Philistines? It takes more than believing that God is big. Beloved, it takes more than believing that God is big. You need to believe that God is God for you. That is why David is able to speak the way he speaks. That is why his brothers are so mad because they, perhaps they didn't think of it first themselves. But David is convinced not only that God is God, but that God was their God. And the God who was for them. The one who created all things, who rules over all things, who had made promises to them. I will never leave you or forsake you, he said to Joshua. When Joshua beat back the Anakim in the days of old. This is a promise that requires faith, faith that the Israelites were far too lacking to show, faith that sometimes we are lacking in. As we look at the giants in our lives, in our societies, we think about the enemies of God, and they seem so great, and indeed they are so great, but we fail to remember not only that God is great, but that he is good for us. He loves us. He cares for us. He calls us his sheep, and he is a good shepherd. David had that sort of faith, and by God's grace, he displayed it. But David's faith is, as I think as all faith should be, a bit like a sunbeam. It's a sunbeam, and I mean that in this sense, shining through a window, you think of a sunbeam, and you don't look at the beam itself, at least I hope you don't. You don't look at the, the sun, perhaps, but you look at the thing upon which the beam rests. And that's the real point of this passage. The point of the passage is not the courage of David, the tenacity of David, the skill of David in slinging a stone. It's not even on David's faith. It's on the one in whom he placed his faith. And more than that, the one who would succeed David in the royal line, who would truly stand up to God's enemy, who would stand up to Satan, who would stand up to God's foe when God's people were quaking and shaking and would say, enough is enough. Who is this blasphemer? This is the final contrast that we are to see in our passage, and this is for this I'll close. The final contrast that we see in our passage is the contrast of a champion and his people. We are not the champions, my friends. Contrary to what Freddie Mercury might want us to believe, we may be underdogs in a sense in the world's eyes, but we are not the champions in this story. We are not David in this story, ultimately. We understand this. We should have faith like David. We should have courage like David. We should have conviction like David. We should trust in David's God. And yet, David in this story is the redeemer. We are the scared Israelites. We are the ones who depend upon one who is anointed by God to stand up to God's enemies and to slay this dragon. And that is exactly what we find is exactly what we find in the face of this anointed one of God, Jesus Christ. This is exactly what Jesus was doing in his earthly ministry. Do we remember this in the Gospels? When Jesus shows up on the scene, what are some of the first things that he's doing? He's preaching the kingdom and he's slaying the demons. He's casting them down. He's oppressing the oppressor. 
And he says to his disciples, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. What did Jesus come to do? He came to bind the strong man, he tells us. He came to beat devil. He came to beat Satan. He came to destroy Goliath. He came to slay the dragon, as Revelation 12 reminds us. This is our Jesus. This is our David. David's greater son. This is the one to whom we look. Again, we don't be like Eliab who's just indignant. Don't be like the scared Saul who's not sure how this is going to end. But understand that this man of God, who is God himself, is the champion. That God is the one who does fight for you. Not only does he equip you in your fight, but he is the one who secures your fight because he secured it on Calvary's cross. He is the champion to whom we are to look, the one that David points us to, the one in whom we are to place our trust as we face down Goliaths in our own lives. Indeed, we are to fight. The Bible tells us to fight, to fight the good fight. Paul even says that to Timothy as he's going to his own death. He says, I have fought the good fight. But to Timothy, if you know 2 Timothy, hopefully you know 1 Timothy, Timothy would hear that language and remember what had Paul told him previously about that fight In 1 Timothy chapter 6, I want to close with these words. It ends in a doxology, fittingly. But as for you, Timothy, O man of God, flee these things. That is all the allurements of the world, all the devices of Satan. Flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. And how do you do that, Paul? Paul? by taking hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you, Paul says, in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing, the triumph of our Lord Jesus Christ which he will display at the proper time, he who is blessed and the only sovereign, the king of kings and lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Let's pray together. Glory, Lord, you show us glory. That you have indeed raised up a champion for yourself. And it's not any of us here in this room. But it's indeed your only begotten son, God of God, who's come in the flesh to save us from Satan and all the powers of all evil. You you are such a gracious God to reveal these things to us, even in such exciting stories like David and Goliath. Thank you for going for going before us, for defending us. Lord Jesus, we thank you. For 40 days you endured and beyond the afflictions and the insults and the slanders of the devil and you triumphed over them all. We thank you. And we give you all the glory and honor and praise you with your Father and Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen.